What's up, everybody? Welcome to Song 43, a podcast for those of you looking to get a deeper look at how this creator creates while being a mom, working full time, and doing all the things. On this episode, welcome to season two, where we're changing things up a little bit. I'm joined by my drummer, Pete Wilhoit. He's in a band with me called The Vintage Tees, but he has been so many different places and done so many cool things. I had no idea. And he also, when he's not playing drums, is Mr. Mom at home. So you'll find out how he keeps balance and we laugh, we drink coffee, and we have a great time. So I hope you'll give it a listen and check it out. You do. You have plenty to say. I do to you and other people, but I feel like you have to almost make shit up as you go. That's what a podcast is. Oh, well, I'm, I should do that then. You should start a podcast. I, was, I <laughs> thought about it and I was like, I should have had Mark come onto the podcast. Which will have to happen as like episode two. Yes. Because the three of us. <laughs> mm-hmm. So, all right. So we're listening. You're listening to Song 43 with Pete Wilhoy. Hello. And Laura Davidson. Laura Clapp Davidson. Laura Clapp. I have like several names. You never had to deal with that as a musician. Peter Francis Wilhoy. No, my parents wanted originally to name me Grover Cleveland Wilhoy the third. They did not. Yes. That was my dad's name. He's a junior. So... But my mom said, it, no. it w- "Was his dad Grover Cleveland? Yes, like the Grover Cleveland? <laughs> no, not the, not the, but he the was president? a Grover. <laughs> yes, <laughs> wasn't he the president alert. in like seventeen eighty nine or something? Like what the yeah, hell? I'm about a hundred and four. I just mm. just want to. You look that good. Clear. Thank you. You look good. Thank you. Okay. All right. No, but like this was a thing when I got married. It's like, what do I do as an artist? So I I dropped my middle name, which was Elizabeth." Which is now my daughter's name. Yes. But yes. she doesn't even say go by that, right? She doesn't. Maybe when she's older and distinguished. Yeah. yeah but, so. you know, but like there isn't the question like as a guy, like Pete Wilhoit gets married and is Pete Wilhoit the drummer still? But Laura Clapp gets married and then becomes Laura Davidson, who has lauraclapp.com for, you know, right. several years prior to becoming Laura Davidson. True. And it's all about your website URL. True. No, I, I don't know. It's just, it's a weird thing. I do remember when websites were coming out, my friend was like, you need to go on and... Secure it? Secure a bunch of them, like sex.com and... <laughs> Did you? No, that was a I smart friend. But, the, but yeah, he's he was right. I just... You didn't listen. You know, I think I was watching television or something at the time, so... Mm. I half listened like my son does. I love you, Ethan. Yeah. <laughs> it's all he's going to hear is sex.com and be like, <laughs> Dad... Don't let so so listen. Don't to look it. that up. Don't look that up. No. Please, not on any work sanctioned devices. Highly <laughs> not recommended. <laughs> um, all right. So I met you, I think, when so so was at GCC, right? That's right. Yeah. And you were like this mysterious tall person was who I? would dro- walk in at drop off and not say any words, probably because it was wicked early and you were like, Rrr. and probably. yeah, I used to stand there and be like, I wonder who that guy is because. He looks like my people. Like, I could tell you were a musician. Oh, well, that's good. I guess I was doing something right. You were. Because isn't that half the battle when you're young and you don't know what to do and you're like, I need a look. I need to look like a musician. That is something that I thought about just yesterday, actually, because I saw this headshot of a woman of a certain age who was like really over the top in her style. And you Mm -hmm. know, as a woman of a certain age, that she's been doing that. That's like her thing, right? Yes. I never had that moment where I was like, my thing is I will look like, you know, musician all the mm-hmm. time. I just kind of look like a J. Crew catalog half the time. Which is fine. No, nah, it's, is it's it though? fine. I've, I've told myself that's one of the many reasons like, why I'm not I mean, you famous. you have buttons on the side. That's I hip. I don't have any buttons on the side. But you're wearing a t-shirt, yeah. a fiction plane t-shirt. Thank you. Here oh, on. oh. Look at all those dates. Oh all my right. God. That's, that we got to talk about that. So anyway. Yeah, people have like a look. Oh, was I supposed oh. to mute that? You were. Wow. Okay. Okay. Um, when I used to live in Brooklyn, 
there was this lady who would she was from head to toe neon green. That and was she her was thing. wow. She was probably in her late sixties, and but I see, feel like that was her thing her entire life. And she uh, and she was, probably wasn't a musician. Probably wasn't an actress. No, she just, was just a New like, Yorker. Yes, just a New Yorker. Exactly. That's a whole other echelon of. Weird. It is. When you're in, from the Midwest, which I am from, you try a bunch of stuff, uh, look-wise, at least I did, but it, nothing was that crazy. I had never went super crazy. Um, and then you go to New York, and like I wasn't even on the radar here. No. This is just, it's... you're just a normal dude. But then you wonder if it's like, how much effort is put into trying to look different? True. Or did these people just naturally embody that? True. You know, I mean, I don't know. And then I'm like, well, because I don't naturally want to wear like, you know, haute couture, does that mean that I am never going to be a famous person? Yeah. I think that ship has sailed. Yeah. But that's okay because we have the vintage tees, which we do. is fulfilling, uh, filling a gap in my Good. creative soul. I Good. mean, I think we have a lot of fun. I love that band. I, we are ridiculous. It's really fun. <laughs> we should talk about our paid rehearsal <laughs> <laughs> that happened. Let's, let's talk about it. Um, yeah, so I totally loved that gig. It was fun. Because we really had a paid rehearsal. The Dockside Brewery. A cool place. Yeah, which I did not know existed. Me neither. Who were we actually supposedly performing for? Do I don't know. Doctors? <laughs> Doctors. In the other room. Yeah, so let's set the stage here. <laughs> so. <laughs> All right. Monday we get a, a storm. Tuesday school's canceled so we're like losing our minds anyway because we're gonna get not into even this sure if the gig's still on to yeah be honest. well you you texted early it was like 10 in the morning you're like gig is on it's happening yeah and i only got that because my contact who's a doctor who very nice guy said i think it's still on yeah he had no way so of that canceling sounded official. it that's what we found out yeah he had no way of canceling it so all day i'm like no no way this is not happening because like it was ice the the roads were still ice so we get there at 4.15. Pete forgot a key piece of equipment. <laughs> I mean. What happened? Who Tell needs us. symbols? Tell us, Pete. Honestly. But, well, all right. So I was almost to the bridge and realized I don't have my symbols. And it's drums and cymbals, mm. in case you're wondering. It is. I play both. <laughs> and I didn't have the cymbals. <laughs> That's a necessity. Which was a positive of it being a semi-local gig. Semi. Because if I was, you know, playing in Pennsylvania or something and I was halfway there, I would kind of be screwed. You would have. You would have had to stop at like a guitar center. Oh, I've done. We've done that on the road. We've probably all done that on the road. Oh, 100 percent. A hundred percent. Yeah. Anyway. Guitar stands, strings, cables. Yeah. So we get set up in this really nice spot. Yeah. And we're like, oh, this is going to be cool. They cleared out all the tables that were right in front of us. We got a, had, had a nice sound check. Like we were ready mm -hmm. with time to spare. Mm -hmm. People show up and they stay. <laughs> they stay. They stay about 100 feet <laughs> inside <laughs> another room to our right, which we can't see. Right. So they're there. They were there and they were having a great time. They were. And they liked us. But they did. I mean, how could you not? Uh, well, come on. We are a delight. <laughs> but I mean, it was the trippiest thing. And I've done some trippy gigs in my life, but I was like, no one is coming out here. I've done some bad gigs. That yes. wasn't a bad gig because yeah. I love the band. You sounded amazing. Thanks. You too. And there were people there. Yes. I was thinking about that the other day. At one point, I'm trying to think what's the lowest, like of the lowest of the lows gigs. I remember <laughs> playing the achy breaky heart <gasps> for five or six 80 year olds in the basement of a moose lodge. When, when was this in your career? I was, I was a senior in high school. So oh, just okay. Out. All right. But I asked for, you know, called me. and then the topper was after we played the achy breaky heart, they requested the chicken dance, which oh. we played. Wow. So did they request it on repeat though? I thought you were gonna say you played it for five to six hours. Like that's what I thought you were gonna say. That no, but I just I think I distinctively remember at that moment I hope gigs aren't all like this, playing you mm. know, the Icky Bricky Heart and then the chicken dance just was the the icing on the cake. 
the, the feather on the bird. I don't. I can't even make something funny up for that. I don't know. Well, anyway. yeah. I mean, I played some really weird gigs too. I I think the gigs I hate the most are when you play and you feel like you're putting the people out who are listening. Yes. Like, why do venues book bands when people are like pissed off when you start making any sort of noise? True. Well, I have two scenarios for that. One, we were supposed to, we played, I played in a cover band that eventually became an original band in Indiana and we played up at South Bend and it was a bar gig that had a decent stage mm -hmm. and a lot of people in it. A bar. Okay. It was a proper bar and it had a stage and tons of people in it. And they say you're going on at 10 and we oh. realized, wait, the like IU Michigan game, like oh, March Madness no. game is on at 10.15. Oh no. And they turned off all the TVs. So they literally, <laughs> they literally, well, they literally drop down this thing and start oh, no. showing the game. And then we start playing and everyone's like, shut up. Oh no. Yeah, I, it was wonderful. That's yeah. But you know, we got paid and we kept playing. So, so to set the stage, cause we haven't done that at all because i'm okay. a really shitty sure. host because okay. i'm normally talking to myself so pete is a drummer <laughs> for yes. those of you drums just, and just joint drums and cymbals yes. percussion yeah sometimes um who's played in a number of bands and on a number of recordings and which i saw michael mcdonald on the list yeah the doobie brothers that's yes. sweet if i can i can honestly say i have played for president that's Pet. Not president, president. Which, president, which one? Which one? was Jimmy Carter. Oh, yes. damn. Yeah, we did a Habit Habitat for Humanities gig, oh, and it was yes. us, me, G. Smith, and Michael McDonald, and we played, you know, Taken to the Streets and everything. It was really Taken fun. to the exactly. Streets. That's exactly right. It's funny, when I <laughs> got the gig and heard who was on it, I'm like, I wonder what he sounds like. He sounds, is exactly yeah. what you think he's going to look like, and he sounded exactly the way you thought he was going to sound. I love that and about he was him. such a gentleman and a great musician i have so. heard amazing things yeah. about him yeah but so in addition to playing for president mm -hmm. and michael mcdonald mm -hmm. and you know, fiction plane which is really cool and what was the first band you had the deal uh, with? the very first band well i can give you the order it was all this pretty much the same lineup but it okay. was the nixon tapes and then called the nixons and then we switched it to the cutters We're the cutters famous. okay that was the one i saw <laughs> yes okay and you had a label deal and like yep. toured yeah and we uh it took us out to la and we got to record at AM studios oh, sweet. what does week. that mean for the people who don't know what that means okay so AM studio a and m is a record company that also had their own studio mm -hmm. and it's in hollywood california <laughs> and it was the first time i'd ever Where? really been in california for an extended period of time it was the first time i'd ever been to hollywood proper as an indianapolis or indiana person yes so it, there were a lot of hollywood moments there that you just you don't I, I couldn't believe it so when we got there it's this big lot it used to be charlie chaplin's mansion where he used to film all his silent really? movies yes it's a, an amazing lot Holy it really crap. is because it's the henson studios today which is my favorite yes. studio yes yes so this is i want to say 1995 or 94 so we went out there and it's got this giant door on the front door to open right into the main thing and you open it up and Gene Simmons is standing there. Holy shit! And he turns to us and he's like, what's up, fellas? And he does the tongue thing. <laughs> no, he did not. I swear to God. Not in full makeup too, just No, Gene. not in full makeup. Just Oh, just, natural. Oh, natural, yeah. Okay. And you I would like, have preferred the makeup, but... You know, yeah, he's a little, yeah. I'm like, is this what Hollywood's going to be like? Yes, Gene Simmons this showing you insane. the tongue all the time, yeah. everywhere you turn. <laughs> so they put us up in Studio C, and we had five days to record, I think. And one of our engineers was his his grandfather was the the voice of Fred Flintstone. Oh damn! So I'm like, oh, is everybody just famous? Yes. yes. Is that how it works? Everybody's so famous. Yes. Oh my God. Miley and, uh, Cyrus. Did you just sing? I did. Hannah Montana. Did. Miley did. Cyrus. I did. We have a big like Miley Cyrus thread that runs through our band now too which well, i don't I mean, know how i feel about heart, it i, I know it you really just it's okay yeah. all right so that happened <laughs> so our fourth day um of recording our own music original music they said oh do you mind if somebody else is, uses the studio for one day because they really want it and do you mind and we're like no it's fine so we took a break and it was neil young and pearl jam and so i literally <gasps> sat 
I sat in the hallway and put my head up against the wall oh to hear them do Rockin' in the Free World. And I was like a kid in a candy oh store. It was God, amazing. That's the coolest shit ever. It was very cool. It this was is, very rock and roll. This is my Eddie Vedder moment over here that I have. It's crumpled in a heap on God. my desk. Did you, you have him over there? What do you got? Set list. That is awesome. F handwritten from Ohana. That's awesome. Because I... The amazing monitor tech, who is Carrie Kyes, who has been his monitor tech forever, is an amazing human. And I wrote to her and I said, hey, my sister's turning 50. Oh, and we, cool. she is a diehard Pearl Jam fan. Will Eddie like just record like a voice memo or something? And she's like, no. But I will send you some cool shit. That's awesome. And she sent me a stack of these. That's very cool. And an incredible poster. And so I, that is too cool. Okay, so they were recording in there and then you went back in the next day and yeah, cut the and album. Yeah, just kind of like licked the wall yeah. and sat in it, you know. Yeah, just took it all in. Yeah, there was an earthquake while we were there too. I think there's going to be one next week when I'm there and I'm very scared. Oh I'm like super scared of earthquakes. Um, hey, I have a quick Eddie Vetti, Vetter story. So okay. we were on the police tour. We did 110 shows of the police. And of course, side note, you like that little name drop on the, well, on the this police. tour, all the A-list celebrities came out, everybody you can think of, cause it was the hot ticket. So I got to meet a lot of A-list celebrities and honestly, I was not, I'm not very starstruck person anyway. Like you're pretty are, chill, pretty chill. People yeah. are people. But the last show in Honolulu, we did an after party and I go to the after party. It's a pretty small after party. It's us, the police and probably 25 other people. Mm -hmm. And across the room, I see Eddie Vedder. Ed Ved. Oh. And I turn into a, a little screaming girl <laughs> inside. <laughs> it's the only time I can remember being like giddy about wanting to meet somebody. Did you meet him? I totally did. I walked over to him. I just said, I got to. I got to say hello. So we chatted for like half an hour. Oh my God. I Super would die. Super nice guy. I'm so talked jealous. Talked about the Cubs, talked about surfing yeah. and yeah. how he was so appreciative of where he is in life. He could have been a gas station attendant is he what could've. he told me. He could have. Yeah. I mean, he was like, it was rough. Yeah. He says, he, you know, mother love bone and all this stuff just really like, has changed his trajectory of his life. So. Well, he kind of happened into yeah. Pearl Jam too. Yeah. And it was like. Oh yeah, this guy can sing, and then it's like, oh shit, this guy can write, yes. and you know, then and he's got a presence about him. Oh just... god, I was so in love with him. Yeah, me too. Yeah, like watching the Jeremy video where he looks like borderline possessed. True. Or like, yeah, it's, and I'm just like, do it. I love it. Mm -hmm. Everything about this, I love. I think we should write him and ask him if he'll come over to our house. Yeah. So he dinner. walked in today, and I showed him something that Blake had been really adamant about writing. I thought I could just like email a fan email. So when I Googled it, it shows like Taylor Swift at hotmail.com. And I'm like, I am not emailing that. If that is her fan mail address, shame on them. But her management address is, you know, just in, um, in Nashville. So Blake typed a note to Taylor Swift saying, dear Taylor Swift, my birthday is in May. If you're done with the Eras tour, can you just come to my house? <laughs> you can stay for a couple of days. You're awesome. That's very sweet. It was the sweetest thing. And I was like trying not to crush her spirit, but I was like, don't get your hopes up that A, that she, you'll get any sort of response, but she's not going to come to our house, love. But like, I can't, I don't want to rain on her parade. Of course. Yeah. I mean, you got to keep the dream alive to a certain extent. It crushes my soul that it's Taylor Swift, but you know, whatever. I understand whatever i did subject ellie to billy joel the other day on a car ride to mount snow after she subjected me to an hour and a half of taylor swift oh yeah we i pushed the button that used to be xm holly in my car for serious because i like i like the christmas channel sure and it was the i don't even know if it's the week between christmas and doesn't matter anyway i pushed the button it's the billy joel channel now which was a huge excitement for me and yes. she's like oh god <laughs> But how, how did she take it? She took it very well because he played or it played. She's got away and always a woman. Nice. And I told Eric, my hubs, for those not knowing who that is, that I think I told him like when we got married, it's like, by the way, on our 20th wedding anniversary, you have to sing 
either does those he, two songs really? to me. And he does not sing. How old, how old, uh, how long have you been married? It's going to be 17 years in oh, June. Okay. So Ellie, I told Ellie that. So she texted him. <laughs> said, dad, just a reminder. <laughs> Might want to start warming up the pipes. He's got to. Big expectations have been set. Wow. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, okay. Hopefully Taylor Swift will be making a visit. Um, I'm sure she will. Yeah. She'll just roll up. Yep. She's like, P.S. I live near the Guilford High School. That's what she, she put. She knows where that is. I'm she pretty sure. <laughs> I'm glad she put that landmark in. Yeah. Because otherwise she'd be lost. Lo- totally lost. <laughs> She'll get a text. I'm trying to find your house, but I can't. <laughs> I don't know where I am. I wish you had just given me some sort of landmark. Well, you're welcome, Taylor. So I did put a self-addressed stamped envelope in there to get a response. You might. You think? I don't know. I don't know. I would crazier things have happened. I mean, do people still I mean I'm I'm gonna get I'm gonna go with she's probably the most famous musician on the planet right now. She is she might get a couple emails and letters a couple a couple two thousand three thousand oh a day God. maybe they must have interns working non-stop yeah and they might have a stamp that has her her signature, signature oh it. gosh i don't know all right so because we don't have this much time together because you have to do what you, i mean um, we live very close we live near the guilford high school we so. do we do both of us but we could do this again too. This, this could be a 10-parter as i said i would love that <laughs> I but the podcast because you probably haven't listened to it. I love your podcast. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I have never listened to it in my life. It's about being a mom, working full time, and doing all the things. That's I know all of the, those things. The tagline, I'm, and yes. you're not a mom, but you are a dad. I'm, I'm a Mr. Mom. A Mr. Mom, and so this is like that's why I wanted to have you on the show because you have to shift gears like I do, where it's like one minute you're touring with Sting. <laughs> And meeting any better. Yeah. And then the next minute you are cooking filet mignon sliders. No, the next minute True. you're cooking the big green egg on your back deck. Right. And taking so-so to the doctor. Yes. How um, does that, how do you juggle that? Well, that's a good question. I, I will say that I feel lucky in the way that I, early on in my career, I knew that I was going to have to sacrifice something to have a family and i always wanted a family Mm -hmm. and i also have a lovely spouse who has been there from the beginning and seen the entire transformation from playing in the basement of the moose no in senior year have you been together since high school long time she was in high school i was a a freshman in college so oh cradle Mm -hmm. robber okay i see how it is this is true I did not realize this. I thought for sure you met in college. No, we've been together over 30 years now. Dern. Yeah, long time. Oh my God. Marriage is so fucking hard. I mean, that's crazy to think even if I was a musician, but I've seen a lot of my musician friends go through, you know, divorces and just not seeing their family and not seeing their kids. And so in, in a certain way that armed me for, prepared me for what was ahead. Okay. I said, if I want to have a family and make it work, I'm going to have to sacrifice certain things, and I'm okay with that. Um, I, having said that, clearly when you're on the road and you're playing great venues and you're playing mm-hmm. stuff that you've worked your whole life to do, it's a high like no other. It's a mm-hmm. feeling like no other. You want it to last forever, but you know it's not going to. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So. It's um, temporary. It is temporary. And... I think that's, it's sometimes hard, it's hard because you want that more, but then I always say my kids are like no other gig, you know, there's nothing like it and I wouldn't miss that time with them. And so that changed everything when we had Ethan in New York, we lived in New York at the time we had Ethan and I was trying to do gigs and then coming home and Kathy had to go to med school at four in the morning and. Did she go to med school late she in did. life? I was going to say. So we, yeah. He's so what, we, 15? 14? He's 15, yeah. Okay. So we moved to New York when I auditioned for Fiction Plan. I drove from Indiana to New York, met them in a, a rehearsal studio, played four yes. songs, and then six hours later called Kathy from Sting's Place and said, I guess I've got the gig. Which is so great. Which is so weird, too. Um, so Fiction Plan, just for those who don't know, who was in Fiction Plane? 
Yes. Uh, so Joe Sumner is the lead singer, and he's Sting's oldest son. And then at the time, uh, Dan Brown was the bass player, and Seton Daunt was the guitarist. So I drove an audition for that band, and then after the audition, they said, oh, do you want to come back to our place and listen to the rest of the album? And I said, sure. So we got on the subway, and we're chatting, and we go to the Upper West Side, um, Central Park West, and oh, we go in this gosh. amazing apartment. And I'm not kidding you. I did not put two and two together. I'm not very smart. <laughs> and as we're walking up the That's spiral staircase, I <laughs> said, are we in somebody's house? This place is amazing. And I get to the top of the staircase, and there's a giant picture of Sting with like mm. the Dalai Lama or something. Oh my God. And I'm like, oh, it's right. It's coming together. Right. Did you know British who people Joe can own was? property in the in <laughs> US as well? Oh my God. Turns out. <laughs> I thought you could only own property in British land. In one country yeah. at so, a time. Uh, so, yes, that. That is where I call Kathy from Joe's youngest um, brother, and I called from his little like playroom, and I said, "I'm oh my gosh. sitting in Sting's house, so I think I got the gig." And, <gasps> yeah, that's so cool. Anyway, so that brought me to New York. We immediately went on tour, and then Kathy moved out to New York, and was kind of doing her gig that she had at, at Indiana University but knowing full well that she didn't want to continue that. So mm. she actually moved to New York with no real job and then eventually got a job at a publishing group, a medical publishing group. And then after f two or three years decided, I want to, I think I want to be a neurologist. Be a, I want to be a doctor. I mean, you know, so this is how smart my wife is. She studied for the MCATs for like two months Stop. and then got into Yale, Cornell, all these she's no, she's, she's no dummy. She's so lovely. Okay, she's, this is. She's no dummy. So wow. Yeah. Unlike this one. Just where I just, am I? I just hit oh my god! Yeah. Sting's out. <laughs> exactly. Jesus Christ. Okay. So. So she does that. So she does that, and the nice thing was, is Cornell was Cor Cornell Med is on the Upper East Side, so it kept oh, us in New York. Didn't know that. Okay. Yeah, she kept us in New York, and kept me kind of in the New York scene, which I really adore. I love the New York uh, music scene because of the physics of New York and you can go to a lot of venues and see a lot of great dream. musicians. And... Yes. Anyway, um, we had Ethan kind of our last two years there and that's when things kind of started to become very real. As soon as you have a kid, you or for those who have oh. kids, you realize it is literally not about me anymore. No. Nope. Now my life has shifted immediately yes. to taking care of a human. Yes. In fact, I remember walking him home from the hospital at 69th in New York Aww. from Presbyterian, literally holding him in my hand saying, do not drop this baby. Oh, oh my God. <laughs> he is fragile. Do not drop this human life. Wow. This is yours now. So yeah, that was the beginning of the, the new reality, which you... And in, in theory, I was something I'd always wanted and prepared for. Mm -hmm. But obviously, you don't know what you're doing. No, like it's there's no owner's it's manual. Like all brand new, and how am I going to make this work? And you know, I have friends that are going through it now, and it's a, they call me, and I'm like, I wish I had great advice, but to be honest, it's a juggling act. Like you, mm, even there's... if you didn't have m music and just had a normal job, it's a juggling act, right? Just to keep a human alive. Right. <laughs> Turns out. Turns out. So. Yes. Um, there were a lot of late nights with a lot of lack of sleep. And I think the biggest thing, the biggest change and the biggest shift for me was in New York city. If you want to get gigs, it's all about the hang. Like you have to hang yes. out after the gig and yes. you have to meet people. Cause a lot of people get gigs cause they like to hang out with you. Not cause just because you're a good musician. Right. I've said that before. It's yes. Very true. Um, in fact, I mean the level of musicianship in New York is very high. So you better be a good musician or else don't go to New York. Right? Mm -hmm. True. So that, that was something I had to decide, well, I'm not, I just don't want to hang out. I want to go home and be with the family. And, yes, and that's so. when I knew the shift was slightly happening to, you're going to start sacrificing gigs mm. and that's okay. That's okay. Cause I had fiction plane going pretty strong. And the nice thing about fiction plane was they're very respectful guys. And if I wanted time off or, if I could fit stuff in, they would let me do it. And I could bring Ethan and Kathy out 
we did a recording session at Rack Studios in London for a month, and they had a, a flat next door that Kathy sp- slept. In. We all slept in the flat together, and Aww. Kathy swears that Adele was mixing her record above her. Oh wow! Because she, she she knows that right. She says, "I I don't know why, but I know this record inside and out. And I think Adele was mixing this." Oh, that's awesome! And she saw a, what she thinks was Adele on the sidewalk smoking, and she said, "I wanted to go over to her and say your music is amazing. If you ever need a drummer, I get." <laughs> that's so good. Yes. That's what we need. We have yes. that person who's our what our brag person because yes, I can't do. True. I suck at yeah, that. I'm the same way. I'm the same way. That is, that's one thing about the industry, and probably the same um, for if you're going to be an actor or actress, you have to be very self promoting Oh, it's the worst. And it for it, it, it you either force yourself to do it because you know you're not going to, or uh, like I was terrible at self promotion. Same, I still um, am. <laughs> I'm way better at promoting others. Sure. Sure. I mean, you want it to, I always want it to happen naturally. I wanted things to be organic and natural. Like if you like my playing and you like me, great, let's mm-hmm. play. Let's do this. Yeah. Not just because we hung out until four in the morning at a bar and you like my jokes and. He is very funny. You are yeah. funny. Thank you. That's uh, why we got to get Mark in here because the three of us, true. it's like a freaking slapstick show. Although I true. don't know, so much editing's going to have to happen because our level of comedy is like eighth grade it's... boys locker room. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty it's bad. Potty mouth. Mm-hmm. Potty mouth alert. Um, mm-hmm. uh, you know, but that's, that's me. Anyway, um, so there were a lot of sacrifices. The, the, a lot of sacrifices, and I made it my mission to. Any chance I was on a big tour that I had two or three days off, I would come home. Oh, wow. I would make it my mission because either Kathy could come out with Ethan or I would go home. So there was a point where before we had Ethan on the police tour, we played a show in Paris Mm -hmm. and then we're flying to Torino, Italy. Mm. And I can feel like I'm starting to get sick. I know this feeling. Oh, oh, no. I'm really starting to get sick. My body is really starting to get sick. Oh, no. So it's like 12 hours before the show, I don't feel good. Eight hours before the show, I really, I'm throwing up. Oh, no. I'm, it's coming out both ends. Oh, God. I'm not keeping anything down. And now it's four hours before the show. And I can't even stand up. <gasps> I cannot even stand up. I'm on fire. I'm dizzy. I'm not keeping anything down. So it's like the, my biggest nightmare. The head of production is like, why didn't you tell me this earlier? We've got doctors. So he, there are doctors that volunteer to go work the police show so they could watch the show. Oh, oh my so God. This is like the I'm, wall. <laughs> oh yeah. So I'm there on the ground in our, in our uh, dressing room. I literally can't stand up. They take, I've got most of my clothes off oh. already because I'm so hot. They come in and they're all speaking Italian and they're all yelling over me. And they, oh God. a lot of hand gestures, you know, it's, it's Italy. So. It is. I'm going there. I'm so they excited. said, uh, I heard they're going to try and get an IV in me. Okay. Cause now it's at this point, it's like two hours before the show. And then it was one hour before the show. Mm. And they are desperately trying to get an IV in my arm and they're missing. And I'm like, ouch. Yeah. Oh my God. And so they finally get an IV in my arm. And they get some fluid in me, and I will say, it was an am- it was amazing transformation of how fast I felt a yes. little better. Yes. So they said, "Do you think you can do the show?" We're a trio at this point, and they said, "If not, Joe and Seats are just going to go up there and play <sighs> on their own." I'm like, "I think I I think I can play," but oh I'm God. also still throwing up every five oh minutes. Oh my God! Didn't they give you like Fenergan or Zofran or anything? I You're in know. Italy, so you don't know. I don't know. Maybe. That so stuff's magical. I think we talked about it on the podcst. If you listened, you would know. Anyway, I don't. Yeah. Lo- no, sorry. Yeah, well, there you go. I, I'm going to catch up on all of your. You're a full of shit, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> so they put me up on stage. I don't know why I went down this road, but anyway. Yeah. They put me on stage, and I can distinctively remember everything slowing. It was almost like in slow motion. I remember. Th- I remember a bucket. No. Me. And I remember playing, and I remember throwing up, and I remember playing, and then I remember Seton, and almost in slow motion, he was like, two more songs. <laughs> so, I know the reason I'm telling you this is because 
The reason I'm telling you this is because the next morning at five in the morning, yes. I had a flight home because we had three days off. Oh God! That's why I'm telling you this story. So, but did you get on the flight? I did. <gasps> I what? Why do people the get show. the show? The, the, don't get on planes if you are sick. Okay, this is 2007. So. Even pre-pandemic. Oh, my nose is running. Speaking of being oh sick. God. Oh my God! My nose is running. Where's Peter. my mask? Peter, where's my mask? All right, so I you get home for your three days. Flew home. I was just like no sleep, sick as a dog. Get home, and Kathy basically took care of me for three days. I was oh. in bed for three days. But the reason Jeez. I told you the story is because this was my level of commitment to family and trying to and commitment. To I came a, home and I got them all sick. Yes, you're welcome. Ta-da! Yeah, that's my gift to you. Wow. I'm patient zero. No. Yeah, you are. You I, did I that to died, them actually. So then I went back, and our first gig was at Croke Park, and I'm just still kind of like just coming out of it croke park croke park it's in it's in dublin oh you have to google that uh, one yes croke it's a big park. it's a big you know football stadium oh everybody knows where it is and so here's another rock and roll moment so you're in ireland who do you think you're gonna meet in ireland don't tell me you met bono bono on the edge get Stand, out standing Just... right there backstage here's bono on the god edge. Like damn it somebody said cue bono on the edge and they moved them out i shook their hands and then they moved <sighs> Back. I just died. I died. He's met my idols and has kept this yeah, from you've me. You've seen him at the Sphere, and I have not. You saw them in real life. I did. I did. Okay, so let's see. So that was an example of commitment. Very, very committed. Um, also, I w- the other thing was I was in a, I was in a band, right? So I was in a band that was doing pretty well. We had a top ten hit in Europe, and like we had a thing going. Mm-hmm. And that was my identity. So I will say when that band ended, oh yeah, that was kind of hard too. Because that's like oh. part of your identity as a musician. You you label these things. Well, I've done these gigs and I have this thing going and I'm this guy. I'm Pete Wilhite <laughs> from Fiction Blaine, right? Yes, that is, yes. And then when that didn't exist anymore, that was that kind of took me back of, all right, I am still Pete Wilhite, a musician, but... Why didn't it exist anymore? Why did the, what happened with the band? Because you play with Joe. Yes. So there came a point where, I mean, we had been do we toured three albums for a long time, and we did really well. And we at one point sold out a three thousand seat venue. It was like our our goal to sell out the Paradiso in Amsterdam. Wow, that's a and we did okay. it. And I was we made a DVD, and it was like the height of our, you know, the the fiction plane echelon was met i guess okay and then we switched labels our second single didn't have that many spins blah 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 you've heard the story before so things just started kind of going down a little bit instead of to 3000 then it was 1500 then it was probably 800 then it was 400 and then at this point i'm living in new york joe's living in la Mm. and the and the guitarist lives in london so it takes a lot to keep a band together if you even live in your hometown, right? Oh, or yes. the same town. Although the so, vintage tees are gaining yeah, momentum. I mean, Look out. We are. And Amsterdam. For life. Vintage tees for life. <laughs> vintage tees for life. We're not going anywhere. No, literally. <laughs> but that's okay. We are having a blast going nowhere. So that just kind of um, ended because it was becoming a lot to stay together. And if we had more success i think in big in bigger territories we probably would have could have kept going honestly we could have kept going but joe just didn't really want to do it anymore he wanted to try something else and i totally respect that so that ended and then um i was more of like you know mr mom mr mom which it's funny because the arc of my life has been Kathy has been there for me trying to make it a musician and me, you know, having these moments of success. And then she went to med school and now she's the real rock star because she's having huge success. And I'm kind of the guy at home taking care of home stuff and which playing music. Which is totally valid. Which is totally valid. Yes. But I get it. It's like when you have to shift gears or to sh- like just shift hats. Yes. It's really hard. It is. And in the music industry, like a lot of things in the arts time is not necessarily your friend so you <laughs> i don't know i look fabulous Heart. you know 
I love the question. Oh, you're still making music? Don't you love that? You get that too, right? Or you're still trying to make music. You're still trying. <laughs> oh, Peter, you still playing? Oh, That's so great. Yeah. No, they get that look on of their course, face and you're like, of course you do. What the hell? You wouldn't go to a doctor and say, oh, are you still practicing medicine? <laughs> practicing? Unless they're when like, are you going to do it for real? Oh, God. I know that's the worst. Why do we it's say dumb, that? I don't know. That was not a good. Don't one. practice on me. I want. I want Please the real do not thing. practice. I would like a professional. Um, exactly. Yes. Uh, yeah. That I think that's par and parcel for being a musician. That we don't have. I don't. My daughter, my lovely daughter, asked me the other day, "If you weren't a musician, what would you do?" And I said, yes. "Honestly, honey, I don't know." She's like, "No, seriously, Dad, what would you? Do? What would you do?" And I'm like, like uh, "I've never had a plan B. I wanted to be a baseball player." And that ended, you know, That's my senior year in high school. <laughs> with injury. Well, yes. I will say, if you want to be a musician and you know you want to be a musician, either be, be a bass player or a drummer. True. You got a lot of work. I'm People I'm just saying. Need it. Especially, I mean, this is kind of one side of it, especially if you're a chick, because right. like, we're still like unicorns. Yes. That's I say true. we, like, I play bass and drums. I don't. I have one on you the should. wall. I'm a total fraud. I can't even, I don't even, no, it's a really nice bass. Too. Anyway. P- play the bass or the drums. Yes, is the I played with story. a lovely bass player, Hagar. I forgot Benyari. I think is her last name. She's from mm. Israel and played with her in New York. Oh, sweet. She, yeah, and, and she, she got gets... the James Corden gig. Oh, she, she moved to L.A. and that's, had the whole thing going. That's my friend Ida played with Prince <sighs> until Love he died. It. Yeah, she is the funkiest, tastiest bass player, awesome. as they say. She's so good. Ida Nielsen, funk Ida. Love it. Yeah. So here I am. In Still Guildford. happy to play music with yes. people like you. And uh, I don't know. I mean, it's hard to, it's easy to look back and say, oh, I wish I'd have done these things differently. But I'm really thankful for all the amazing things that I have experienced. All, you know, seeing the world playing music has been amazing. Um, I'm hu- still humbled every day by my kids and just life so <laughs> i'm just thankful because the i could have th- things could have gotten gone a lot worse for me let's just say that you could have been a gas station attendant i could have been a gas station attendant. nothing wrong with that Eddie. nothing at all but now we're pumping our own gas so you really yeah, wouldn't true. have to attend to anything true. so Even then new jersey is that still a thing in new i jersey? don't know full serve Come on, new jersey get, get it with it okay. all right well thank you for joining me yeah we on should my do this again because podcast. I mean, this is just the tip of the iceberg. It is. We could talk about all kinds of things. Really, we we should. All we right, should. we're getting we're getting Mark on here next. That's that's all there is to it. Amy Amendola. Amendola. Oh God, we're gonna have way too much fun with that. He just texted earlier and said, "Could you see the tag on my shirt yeah, during did, the gig?" Yes, I saw that too. Did you see a tag? I didn't on see a shirt? tag on his shirt. I didn't see a tag the blue on. shirt. What did you say he looked like? <laughs> he was a valet guy. <laughs> <laughs> Let me park Sorry, your Mark. car. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god anyway well, we have way too much fun we do but that's t- to say that there's lots of different things you can do in this industry oh yeah Tons. and still be mr mom and mrs mom and you know yep. and here we are and here we are and we're carrying on so there you go <laughs> yes so anyway well thanks for having me thanks for being here thanks for the coffee thanks for listening everybody so glad that you're here and as always, thanks for listening. Just call me, honey. If you please, just call me, baby. I'll be a fantasy. I need your love. I can guarantee I'll be what you need. Just call me.